and we're given by Mia and Ling. Uh, we're going to be doing an introduction to some ideas in uh, deep learning. So uh, the program for this tutorial is to have a look at general concepts of uh, supervised learning with neural nets. Then we're going to switch to uh, presenting the ba basic introduction to convolutional neural networks. Uh, we're going to talk about recurrent nets. And uh, we're going to finish with uh, an overview of some other interesting uh, deep learning models. So um, supervised learning. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the concept of supervised learning. But since you haven't had the machine learning tutorial yet, let's go over the basic idea first. So that, say that you are given an uh, example input-output pairs, x and y. So in this case, it would be, you know, say that you have x is the position of uh, dots on this uh, square, and y is the color of the dots. So say blue is 1, uh, red is 0. Uh, what you want to learn is to predict uh, the association between x and y. So if I give you a new point y, is this going to be blue or red? So uh, the general idea is that you probably want to learn some sort of rule that allows you to map from the x, so the position, to the color, the y, such as this kind of coloring of the square. Um, as you might be familiar with, there are many uh, different approaches from statistical learning, machine learning, et cetera, that deal with supervised learning. Some of the names in this space are various types of regression, so like logistic regression, uh, support vector machines, decision trees, neural networks, et cetera. So today we're going to focus on the, obviously, the last uh, element of this list. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the simplest possible uh, artificial neuron that can perform the type of problem that I just described here. So the simple perception. Simple perception is something that is uh, mathematically described by uh, this expression here, which is the uh, or rectifying uh, it's a linear, linear threshold unit, uh, which is something that was uh, presented by, already by Michaela Kompitz uh, in the 40s as a first initial model of how a, a neuron might work, uh, composed by some, you know, some inputs represent, that could correspond to the input, synaptic inputs coming in on the dendrites, um, linear uh, integration, and uh, a nonlinearity applied to it. So in this case, you would have a, the neuron that performs a linear uh, combination of the inputs, adds possibly a bias term, and then performs some sort of nonlinearity, which is represented here by G. Uh, in this case, for the problem that we're uh, showing here, the nonlinearity would be like a step function, so zero if the uh, argument is negative or one is if the argument is positive. Um, this particular functional form can learn to perform this type of uh, discrimination. So uh, in fact, in this case, you would have that if your vector w of your weights is this vector here, um, the, the simple perception will learn to assign the value one to the dots in the blue area of the plot and the value zero to the dots in the uh, red area of the plot, uh, thus solving our initial uh, problem. Um, Rosenblatt, already in the late 50s and 60s, uh, showed that you can actually, if you have a problem like this, you can train a simple perception to uh, solve this problem by applying uh, a learning rule that he expressed like this, where eta is some sort of um, uh, learning uh, parameter and t is your target value, and y is your, the output of the, the current output of the, of the neuron. Right, but this leads us to talking about linear separability, because the example we just presented is kind of ideally suited to the very simple neuron that we were discussing, um, because the different classes that we want to distinguish can be separated by some sort of linear uh, boundary. In fact, uh, it turns out that this, uh, this type of neurons can only learn to solve uh, this particular class of problems. As soon as you have a problem which is more complicated, like the one that we present here, where there is no single linear boundary that divides the blue from the red, uh, the uh, perception fails uh, miserably at, at distinguishing them. In fact, you could have one, uh, you know, maybe you have one perception can learn you know, this boundary here, and then another perception can learn this other boundary here. But really, if you want to distinguish these four quad quadrants, what you have to do is to kind of take the outputs of the two perceptions and put them together. So you want to you know, see if this perception is happy, and if this perception is also happy, maybe you're in this area. If they're both sad, they're here, and combinations uh, thereof. So um, this suggests the fact that 
we can solve more complex problems than linearly separable ones uh, just by combining uh, multiple uh, units in, uh, in, uh, across multiple layers, as we have uh, schematized here. Um, this is precisely what is done in what we call a uh, multilayer perception, which is just an arrangement of many simple perceptions in uh, several layers arranged in a, with a feedforward uh, architecture. So a bit of terminology, this would, we would call it the input layer um, com com composed by our uh, input data. This is the output layer. And the things that we have in the middle, we call them um, hidden layers. That's why we call them H. So this, is, this will be the first uh, neuron of the second hidden layer, and so on. Um, right. So the way in which these multilayer perceptions work is totally not surprising, given uh, the uh, symbolical representation. So each of these units just is just a simple uh, perception and just computes its activation uh, from uh, its input. So uh, the units in the first layer uh, just compute their activations from all the uh, inputs uh, from the input layer. And the uh, units in the second layer uh, comp uh, use the activations of the first layer as their inputs, and so on and so forth until we get to the end. One might have like several of these output units. Here I have represented only one for simplicity. Uh, what we call uh, this procedure of kind of passing information forward from the input layer on through the hidden layers out and over to the output layer is called forward propagation because as you can see, information kind of flows forwards from the input to the output. Right. So one cool thing about uh, multilayer perceptions in general is that they are uh, universal function approximators. That means that uh, given enough uh, simple units, and uh, uh, you, can you can use them to approximate uh, arbitrarily well any uh, function that is reasonably well behaved. Um, of course, under certain assumptions as well. Uh, for instance, you need, you're kind of free to pick uh, your nonlinearity in a very broad class of nonlinearities, but it needs to be a nonlinearity. For instance, you can try to show, it's a simple exercise, what happens if G is a linear operation, and you will see that the, essentially the expressive power of, of this uh, network basically collapses down to, one of, to the expressive power of a simple uh, perceptron. Right. So, uh, since we have seen this very nice property that they can, this uh, multilayer perceptions with say one or two uh, hidden layers can represent any uh, functions you throw at them, then why, do, why are we talking about deep learning at all? Why aren't we just happy about fitting uh, simple, you know, shallow networks with one hidden layer? So there's two problems. Uh, one is that uh, this is just an existent proof. It just tells us that there is some network out there that can perform what we want. But it doesn't tell us anything about the fact that the um, number of required units for implementing this function uh, should be reasonably small or achievably small. So a problem of expressivity of your, of your network. And on the other hand, we have no guarantee that actually we have a way of computing this network. So we know that maybe it exists in a mathematical sense, but we have no way of deriving it. Um, so this is something that leads us to uh, in the direction of deep networks, which in fact have two um, like interesting properties. So there's like two arguments to be made in favor of structuring your network uh, with uh, multiple uh, layers. So the first is statistical. Um, deep networks, you know, if you imagine having a network with like many layers computing one from the output of the previous one, uh, are uh, compositional in the sense that they uh, compute features, and then features of features, and then features of features of features. So this is naturally well suited to if you think about uh, the fact that in our world, perhaps many of, our, of the uh, interesting data that you have, and many of the interesting statistical structure that you might be uh, looking at is, has a similar compositional uh, property. So for instance, in vision, you have, you know, you have edges, and you, you can compose edges to form simple shapes, and you can compose simple shapes to form more complex shapes, et cetera, et cetera. So in this sense, the architecture of deep networks can reflect something that is going on in our world. And I, I believe perhaps uh, Max Tegmark might say something about that in his talk later during the school. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the other reason uh, for which deep nets are useful is also computational. Under certain uh, conditions, you can show that uh, deep architectures are more expressive. So for a given number of hidden 
uh, units that you can that you have for assembling your network, you can basically learn more patterns if you arrange them in a hierarchical way. Right. So um, we have seen why we care about networks with many layers. Uh, and in the previous lecture, uh, I assume you have uh, learned about how you optimize things, right? So, and you have learned that for optimizing things, it's good to do, you know, uh, gradient descent is a, is a good approach. So say that we have a particular network and we can define some loss for our supervised learning problem. Um, it's, it's an interesting problem to, you know, we want generally to compute uh, the derivative of this loss with respect uh, to the parameters of this network because we want to do gradient descent on it, right? So the classic way in which we do this com computation is called backpropagation. Um, the, uh, this backpropagation is really uh, a mathematical trick. Uh, it's an application of the chain rule, and it's just a way of computing derivatives in a simple and manageable way uh, across an arbitrarily complex graph of computations defined by your um, network. So the way, um, yeah, the, the two key intuitions that, stay, that, that, that support backpropagations are the following. Uh, not, well, not intuitions, and facts. Uh, the first is that if you want to compute the derivative of the loss of your network with respect to, say, the weights um, that parameterize a specific uh, hidden unit, uh, you know that the, um, the, 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 the loss will depend on these weights only through the activation of that unit. The second uh, key fact is that the derivative, the, essentially the, the, yeah, the derivative of, that, uh, of, of the loss with respect to, the act, to that activation will only depend um, uh, on the activations of the units that are downstream from the first one. But OK, let's see how it works in practice. So remember, you want to compute all the derivatives like d of l over the w's, where the w's are inside these nodes here. So, um, you start by computing your first, um, to compute the, fir the, the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights in the third layer here. So the, loss, the, the weights that are inside here, you can just do it very simply by one, like apl applying once uh, the chain rule. You just der derive the, the loss uh, from, uh, by, uh, with respect to the, uh, to the output value, and then you derive the output value with respect to the weights, and you're done, because that's just one step. Then. The interesting thing is that when you keep applying the chain rule backwards and backwards uh, to compute derivatives with respect to the, the, uh, the units in the previous layers, you see that uh, basically you can express the derivative of the loss with respect uh, to the activations in the second layer as the product of the derivative of the loss with respect uh, to the third layer by uh, the derivative of the activation of the third layer with respect to the activation of the second layer. And again, exactly as above, Every time that we have the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation of in one layer, then we can directly plug it in in an expression like that that immediately gives us what we care about, so the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights. So the derivative, of, again, for the second layer, the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights is, again, just the derivative of the loss with respect to the activations in that layer multiplied by the derivative of the ac activations with respect to the weights. So like, you can keep doing this over and over again. And the cool thing is that as long as you keep these uh, values here that we call the errors, so the derivatives of the loss with respect to the activations, so as you can hear, with respect to y and h2 and h1, as long as you kind of propagate them back um, through the network as you're taking these derivatives, you can always compute these quantities in a fully local way. You see here, you only need this quantity that came from the layer above, and this is an entirely local quantity. It's something that only has to do with the relationship between uh, the activation in the second layer and the activation in the first layer, as you can see here with these blue lines. So yeah, this is a, essentially just a convenient way of, uh, and principal way of computing all of these derivatives that is what you care about uh, for gradient descent uh, through an arbitrarily complex uh, graph of feedforward forward computations. Um, all right, we can actually make a more concrete example uh, just to give you a better idea. Say that we have a quadratic loss that is something that looks like that. Um, that's something that you define, you pick. Uh, say that your uh, nonlinearity is a hyperbolic tangent. So this is just a kind of a, sig a sigma translated uh, sigmoid. Um, 
if you just plug this in into this machinery here, you will see that you can compute all the numbers you care for. So um, because of the definition of this, uh, of, of, of this uh, way in which uh, activations are coming from the previous layers, you can compute directly the derivatives of, say, activation in layer L with respect to activation in layer L minus 1. Uh, and this is just given by, by this expression. Remember that the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent is just 1 minus square of the argument. So you get a, like a 1 minus square of the activation multiplied by the derivative of what's inside the hyperbolic tangent that gives you, so you have this w that comes out. And the same thing symmetrically when you take the derivative of this with respect to the, these weights, w, i, k, you get again this term 1 minus the square multiplied by the activation in the previous layer. So you have this, um, these expressions here, you can just plug them in, and you can see that when you take, you know, first step, you take the derivative of the loss with respect to the output, and it's just one, uh, y minus t. And you can see why we're calling this thing the error that we're propagating. I mean, this is really uh, an error term. Um, and then you can just like go backwards, and because now you know how much, this is a number now, right? Because say that, for instance, for a particular uh, data point, uh, your target value was 1 for the classification and your output value was 1, this number here would be 0. If instead it was 1 and 0, this would be, say, minus 1, something like that. So this is a number now. And then you can plug this number into this other expression. You can compute this because these are also numbers, right? Because in previously, when you had forward propagating the, inf forward propagated the information from the input to the output, you have computed. You know what is y and you know what is the activation of the previous layer. So these are all numbers, and you can compute. This is a concrete number that you can plug in into your uh, gradient descent procedure. And you can just do that over and over until you have everything that you need to take a step in your uh, gradient descent. Yes? Sorry, I'm going to come closer, and then I'm going to oh, repeat sorry. the question. Sorry, I just want to make sure that I un understand conceptually what's yeah. happening. Um, can I, can I, I don't know if everyone's sure. hearing. Um, so because you're getting an error term at the output, right, that adjusts the weights yeah. right, right before it, and because those weights need to adjust the weights before that, also adjust to give you yeah yeah kind of it, yeah it's 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 more yeah it's basically if you write down so if you want to write down the you know you want to write down the you just compute in derivatives here, right? I mean le leave alone the the idea of like adjusting weights, but. Sure. Um, so you just want to compute the derivative of this with respect to that. And then if you think about the chain rule of the, the derivative, the derivative of essentially in spirit, the derivative of this with respect to that would be the product of the derivative of this with respect to that. And then you're going to have this with respect to that, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that's why you get all these terms that, uh, that propagate back, basically. Because you see that this, uh, d this derivative here will appear, this, this term here will appear uh, down here, etc., and then you will take this one and plug it here. Is it? No. Cool. Any other question? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. If you want to, for fun, you can derive it, the gradient, these gradient terms with respect to the bias terms B that I have ignored until now. If you want to try to see how how this works. Uh, okay, so this was the last slide of our uh, multilayer perception stuff, but I wanted to conclude it with just uh, a couple of citations here, just for historical perspective, uh, talking about cycles of hype. So this was um, an extract from the New York Times in 1958, uh, talking about the simple perception. The Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Dr. Frank Rosenblatt, a research psychologist at the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory, Buffalo, said perceptions might be fired to the planet, says mechanical space explorers. So this is for the simple perception that does uh, linear, linearly separable problems. So of course, you know, things were, people got very excited. And then 10 years later, essentially, I'm not going to read through this, but uh, the community recognized that there were several limitations to these uh, devices. And that's basically when was, if you've ever heard of uh, the uh, first or second um, AI winters, this was the first uh, AI winter that, uh, that happened when people realized that it was hard to train uh, multilayer 
perceptions uh, without uh, knowing about backpropagation and people were not really sure about whether they were ever gonna be useful for anything. So, um, now let's switch gears and say something about uh, ComNets. So, um, in general, uh, if we think about the problems in vision about say object detection and object recognition, um, what has been traditionally been done in the uh, computer vision uh, community uh, was the traditional approach was to essentially spend a lot of time and effort and uh, from very smart people to devise uh, in, uh, useful ways of essentially reducing the dimensionality of images uh, and representing them uh, with some uh, features that would be yeah, useful for the purposes of say uh, image recognition or say you know the, the problem that is illustrated in this picture is say oh find the toy train that is hidden in this picture actually there's two of them one is here and one is there and there is a complicated algorithm to compute features from these uh, from these pictures that allow you to make sure oh look this actually matches that even though it's distorted it's rotated it's partially occluded and you can do all that if you spend a lot of time thinking carefully about how you're going to represent your images um, also, uh, parts-based model was something that were used. So the idea was to really uh, put a lot of thought into how to represent your input images. But in deep learning, we're um, lazier, and we don't want to spend time doing that. We want our machines to learn uh, useful represent automatically learn useful representations of our input data. Um, in particular, in vision. Uh, the way we're doing this comes from an intuition, uh, for, um, comes from, a, from an analogy uh, with neuroscience. Uh, in particular, the thing we're thinking about is the work by Hubel and Wiesel, and of all their incredible and fundamental work, uh, the main ideas that we care about today are the idea that uh, in visual cortex, uh, connections and activities are organized topographically, that is to say that activities of neurons in visual cortex retain to some extent the spatial organization of the stimuli uh, impinging on the retina. And on the other hand, uh, the, the, there is a hierarchical organization of different types of cells. So that you could, you could think of simple cells as being essentially a linear combination of whatever output comes out of appropriately arranged um, cells from the LGN, and then that you have a uh, complex cells that there are some more complicated uh, combination of uh, outputs of simple cells. So these two ideas are what uh, we care about today. And already in the 80s, in the early 80s, the, this is work by Fukushima with a network called uh, Neocognitron, which is uh, schematized here. It was an awesome name, by the way. Um, they, uh, this is, he took directly inspiration from the work of, of Hubel and Wiesel and implemented this network where the idea of a hierarchical organization of different types of cells is represented by uh, the fact that you have several layers uh, on top of each other and each layer is connecting to the next layer in a fit forward fashion and what the way in which he called these, these layers are simple layer complex layer simple complex simple complex which uh, would correspond in modern uh, terminology uh, to convolutional pooling convolutional pooling etc we will see what that works uh, what that uh, means. And uh, the other idea about uh, the topographical organization of the connection is that these connections across layers have some element of uh, spatial locality. So that there is this idea of some operation being performed, like the, uh, basically performing the same operation over and over again across multiple locations uh, to go from one layer to the next. Um, right. So, uh, but this is just to give the intuition for the connection to neuroscience. Um, but let's see what are the um, ingredients of a canonical modern uh, convolutional network. So, um, this is the recipe that we're not gonna uh, discuss uh, in detail, but basically the ingredients are this. So, you need to be able to perform convolutions, to take nonlinearities, to do something called pooling, and to have fully connected layers. Now, Fully connected layers uh, is, are something that we have, it's basically what we have discussed just earlier with the multilayer perception is the same thing. And now we're gonna go into a bit of detail uh, concerning the other three ingredients to, to see, what, see what they are, basically. 
And the way in which these ingredients are arranged uh, is schematized by this uh, figure here from the uh, paper by Jan Lecun in uh, 1998. As you can see here, there is a convolution um, pooling, that's a convolution, nonlinearity pooling, uh, convolution nonlinearity pooling, fully connected, fully connected output. Um, so, what is a convolution? Uh, so to give an, a, the idea of a convolution is basically, intuitively, is the idea of having, taking, say, some small filter and applying it over and over again at all possible positions of an image and taking the output of that as your next, uh, as the output of your operation. So an example of this uh, type of operation would be blurring an image by replacing each pixel in the image by an average of its neighbors. So how would you do that? This is the mathematical form of what I just uh, explained. Um, you could do this if this is your image. So this would represent these numbers and these colors would represent grayscale, va grayscale uh, values. Um, you could essentially you convolve your input with this filter here. What that means is that you can imagine taking this filter, which is just a bunch of ones, well, divided by nine. So it's like one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, et cetera. Um, kind of superimpose it to your uh, input image and then basically take the dot product between all these elements and the elements in the picture. So what this does is it just takes, an, because these elements are all the same, it just takes an average across all these uh, pixels. So when you put it <coughs> here on top of this area, these are the, the values in the original image are all zero. So you're taking an average of a bunch of values that are all zeros. So the output is just a zero. Oh, I'm missing, a, there should be a zero in here. Anyway, um, then when you move forward, you have now, <coughs> you're applying now your convolution to the next posi position to the right. And you have a taking average that is across eight pixels that have zero value and one pixel that has a value of 90. So the uh, result is 10 and so on. So when you move again, now the average here is 20. And in the same way, you can see when you get to say computing the average for this point, you can see that the um, average is not, should be now 90 because all these elements are 90. So y as you apply this operation, sliding this filter all over the image, you can see that this is the uh, your final output. So this is your smoothed version of your input image. Is it more or less clear? Okay, cool. So one tricky thing that you can notice uh, about this is that the output image actually has this border here. It doesn't have the same, so the, the, the real output image is just this part, right? It doesn't really have the same size as the input image. And this is just purely due to geometry because there is no way of taking this filter here and applying it to every possible position of the, uh, of the input image in such a way that the filter doesn't kind of spill over uh, the borders of the original image. So uh, because of just this geometrical constraint, uh, the output size will, un unless you're padding your input image with some values, you're extending it somehow, your output size will generally change. Uh, according to this formula that if you spend a minute thinking about it, you can convince yourself it's true. Uh, the, the size of the output will be given essentially by one plus uh, the linear size of your input minus the size of, the, uh, of your kernel or your filter divided by the stride. So I haven't said what the stride is. Uh, the stride is just the size of the step you take uh, in the input for every step you take on the output. So here the stride is one because every time we move by one in the input, uh, sorry, in the output, we are also moving by one in the input. If stride was two, uh, by when we move by one here in the output, we will be basically skipping a pixel. So it will be going say from here to like here. So it's just a measure of like how far you jump on the input every time you move one step on the output. So in our example, anyway, this is one, so it doesn't really matter in this formula. Um, another thing uh, about convolutions is that we have seen this example that was done on just grayscale images. But in general, when you have an image, you have, uh, say, if it's just a, most images, you have, we will have three channels because yeah, RGB, it's a color image. And in, also, if you're applying a convolution in the middle of a, of a neural net, uh, you will have an arbitrary number of, uh, of channels in general. So um, your filters actually, they're not just two dimensional things, but they are three dimensional and they have also uh, a dimension, a depth dimension. 
Um, and this depth dimension must match the depth dimension of your input layer. And so for instance, in this case, where we have an image which is 32 by 32, and say three channels for RGB, um, our, uh, our convolution, the operation, what it does is it convolves a full slice of this input uh, with a five by five, say, by three filters, a filter, and it outputs just one single value, right? So it collapses the uh, depth of the input onto just one value. And so if you imagine sliding this thing all over the image, you will get that, OK, according to the formula that we just saw in the previous slide, you will get something which is 28 by 28 by 1, because every, pos every possible position of this filter gives you just one output value. And then what you can do is you can have multiple filters. So you can uh, say, if these are feature detectors, you might imagine you know, looking for different types of features. Um, and say you change the type of filter, you recompute the whole thing, you get another 28 by 28 by one uh, bunch of numbers, and you just stack it on top of the previous one. And then you do it again, and then you do it again. So what uh, happens in the end is that the uh, depth of the output of your convolutional layer will be equal to the number of filters you're applying. So you have one element in this depth di direction for each different filters. And you call each of these colored things, you call them uh, feature maps. And, this, and so each of them corresponds to a representation of your input seen through the particular filter that you were applying at that point. Um, so how this might look with a, with a simple example is that say that you have one filter which is just kind of like a horizontal stretching and the output would be something like that and then you might have say another filter which is just you know a vertical kind of stretching operation and the output might be uh, looking something like that and you might be stacking these images kind of this way so you can have multiple filters and kind of stacking the outputs uh, to stacking the feature maps so uh, something that is uh, very good about convolutions is that as we have seen uh, the dependency, so the output of your convolutions preserve, because the dependencies are all local, they preserve somehow this, the, 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 the spatial structure of your input. You can kind of still see that, you know, pixels that are nearby here are related to pixels that are nearby there. Um, and at the same time, the fact that we apply the same operation over and over again means that we have relatively fewer uh, parameters to learn, uh, as opposed to, say, having a fully connected uh, network, because we not only need to know what's in the filter, and then the filter is the same for all possible uh, positions. Um, so to make this a bit, little bit more concrete, take, for example, uh, <clears throat> uh, an image. Say, if you have an image which is uh, 200 by 200, grayscale, say, and then you want to map this thing to a uh, fully connected layer with, uh, say, 40,000 hidden units. That would amount to about uh, 2 billion parameters. Whereas if you have the same image, uh, but you map it to a, a, a convolutional layer, which has, by a property, choosing the parameters in a, a reasonable way, also has 40,000 uh, hidden units, you would get that the output would be uh, sorry, you would get that the number of parameters would be only 4 million. So it's a dramatic, uh, dramatic difference. So this is one, one, one nice thing because we, we have way fewer parameters to reason about. Um, and the other thing is that actually this way of reducing the number of parameters uh, makes sense, uh, if, especially if you think about a vision. Because if you think of these filters being, again, like some sort of feature detector, to a very rough first approximation, it kind of makes sense to think that the type of features that you're looking at, say, in the top left corner of your image, might be kind of similar to the type of features you're looking, at, you're looking for in your bottom right corner. Of course, I mean, then, you know, to a higher order effect, you can have, you know, you can think about why this might be different given the type of images you have. But in general, you can assume some sort of stationarity uh, of your data in that sense. So it, it, it is a, a very clever thing to do, to just share parameters across different positions. Right. So uh, that was for the convolutional layers. The next ingredient of uh, a ComNet, or well, really any, any artificial neural network, is you need to choose an appropriate um, nonlinearity to put just in front of your um, convolutional networks. And in this case, what we use uh, generally is, is the so-called ReLU um, 
uh, uh, the real unit, which is a rectified linear unit, which has this activation form. So um, if you remember earlier in the multilayer perception example, I, 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 was, uh, I mentioned a hyperbolic tangent, which would be something like that. So like a, non, I can, a saturating nonlinearity. Um, the advantage of using a ReLU instead is that it doesn't saturate for very high values of the input, which means that um, your, your gradient never goes to zero when you have very strong values of your input. And in general, you probably want to avoid uh, having uh, z uh, zero values of the gradients. Uh, in, because if you go back and look at what we have written for backpropagation, if at some point you have a gradient, you have a, you know, you have a derivative which is zero, it basically kills all the other derivatives that comes before that in the computational graph. So, and that basically means that you're not learning. So you want, we like gradients. Uh, and this is the effect, just to visualize what it does. Say if this is a picture where black points are negative and white are positive, uh, it only keeps the positive ones. Um, right. So <clears throat> the final operation we need to implement uh, ComNets is pooling. Um, so uh, pooling is a way, is a coarsening operation. What is usually done is a very popular thing to do is say max pooling is a popular way of performing pooling. Uh, this is, in this particular example, this is done with filters that are two by two and stride two. Let's see what, how it works. So the fact that the filters are two by two, it means that we're looking at one um, uh, area of the input, which is a two by two. And then we take the maximum of that and we discard all the other values. So we take this red area, we look, oh, the maximum is six. And then in our output, we write six. Then if you remember the definition of what a stride is, to jump by one, to the right in the, in the output, we jump by two to the right in the input. So we go here where the green uh, uh, square is. So there is no overlap in this case between the red and the, and, and the green. And we perform the same operation. We discard the seven, the two, and the four. We keep the eight, and we write it there. And we do the same for the other uh, two quadrants. Uh, so this is a way uh, of uh, shrinking down uh, your, uh, your inputs. And it has two advantages. So one is that it reduces the size of the representations in the layer that follows. This makes your data more manageable. It reduces the number of activations and parameters that you have uh, later on. And at the same time, it introduces some invariance to uh, small translations. Because I mean, if you're going to be moving this, you know, these values here, I mean, if you move this thing up, I mean, the maximum of this thing is always going to be 8 I mean, for, for a small adjustment of, 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 this, of these pixels. So this is this introduces some invariance. Um, right. So OK, and just to wrap it up, uh, when we have finished assembling our convolutional neural network using the ingredients that we have just uh, discussed about, then we can just uh, train it. We, we define a loss, and we just train it by uh, gradient descent and backpropagation, as we have seen uh, for the multilayer perception. Uh, so just before I finish, um, um, very quick historical mention. So the key evolutionary steps that, were, that happened to bring us to the modern ideas of convolutional networks, of course, there are many more, but these are just some that I picked. So the first idea of uh, taking inspiration from neuroscience uh, to um, build the first uh, neocognitron, uh, so the idea of this convolutional structure of applying the same operation over and over again over the space by using local connectivity and uh, alternating layers that effectively perform pooling. Um, then uh, 20 years later, uh, the Linet by Jan LeCun uh, that starts to show the uh, structure of modern um, convolutional networks and in, very importantly uh, uses uh, the idea of you know, supervised learning back with backpropagation and gradient descent to learn the weights. So that was a key advance. And then really this is the prototypical fully modern uh, convolutional network, uh, AlexNet, um, that has essentially the same structure as this, as this other uh, device that was published um, 14 years later, the main difference being scale. So what happened between 1998 and uh, 2012? Uh, essentially, digital photography and the internet happened. Uh, so that meant that people were able to <clears throat> uh, download massive amounts of pictures from the internet and curate these huge uh, training data sets using tools such as Amazon and Turk. Um, 
And that was the data that was needed to actually train uh, much larger networks together with the uh, uh, dramatically increased availability of compute, uh, and in particular, uh, the availability of uh, general purpose uh, GPU computing. Um, so these were kind of like the key steps to arriving at the modern conception of a, a ComNet. OK, then just to finish, uh, we have talked about a little bit about how you do this, how you, you know, we have talked about this in the context of image classification. Um, but of course, uh, these tools are very useful, as you all know. We can use uh, convolutional structures for many, many things. This is an example of image retrieval, where you just take the internal representation of an image uh, the computer that is computed by the network, and you just com use the uh, you use it as a representation to compute Euclidean distances between images to, you know, say something like, oh, give me pictures that look like this. Um, and this is what you get. So uh, other applications, of course, include object detections, image segmentation, uh, captioning, and so on and so forth. So I think this is it for the comment part. All right. So we have been talking about uh all those information are like specially located, so like they are represented at 2D X Y dimensions. So when we're talking about a recurrent neural network, before that we are talking about the sequential information processing. Why we are caring about this? Because like there are actually several applications. They are not just like a two-dimensional or three-dimensional data. We are talking about the time series. Like for example, when we're doing like natural language processing. We are looking at a sequence, uh, the, the sentence or paragraphs or speech. The speech signals are like allocated over time. And of course, when you are watching videos, those actions online, they are like, uh, they are also uh, doing like rollout over time. And when we do captioning, you describe the videos uh, according to how uh, the actions happens or, uh, along the, the time. And of course, you are doing like biology, there are a lot of uh, examples in like a protein uh, sequences or the molecular uh, uh, molecular structures or activations. So some classical view, like uh, I know some people probably from uh, base background of, of physics. So one way, like a lot of people dealing with this sequential information processing, one view is from the classical dynamics. We usually thinking about the world as a, describe the world in, in this, as a state. So for example, the state of object as a positions, velocity, or accelerations. And then uh, we can apply some dynamics. For example, we know like the classical Newtonian dynamics. And then apply to the state, and we will see what's a new, uh, a new position, velocity, and acceleration of the object. So basically, we just uh, do this over and over and see the new updates of new, uh, uh, the new observations. And of course, it's not just a closed system. So you can also think about there are some external force applied to the system, to the dynamics. So you can make more interesting changes. And there's some, another view we look at uh, from data generation uh, point of view. So yesterday, we do the probabilistic uh, probability tutorial. So you can think about uh, when you uh, have this sequence, there are actually some hidden states uh, like underlying the data generation process. And one common example people do in speech processing is there are like hidden states to describe how your mouse like move to generate those phones and you are listen. So there are like transition probability to transition between this hidden state and also the emission probability to generate the data you are looking at. So they are like uh, organized along the time and also the emission uh, to generate uh, the observations. So when we talk about recurrent neural network, I would like to take it as pretty general form to describe uh, and process uh, these sequences. And have a, it has a really a generic formula like this. You take an input, and then we apply the recurrent formula, which could be the arbitrary uh, neural network or like functions uh, to do the recurrent processing. And when we apply for it, uh, it basically takes uh, the old state and give you out the new uh, hidden states. And then you can get the output. So very different from the view what we saw before is now the state is only consists of uh, the hidden vector edge. So there's no explicit description of state. So like the position or velocity, 
or the discrete uh, descript, uh, description of a category of the state. So these are just an a, a arbitrary vector. But we can think of it as a summarization of what information accumulated uh, till the time we are looking at. So the general form is what just what I talk about. You take an old state and the input at t, and you spit out the new state for the update information. And of course, when you uh, take, uh, find the observation, you can apply another neural, neural network to read out the value to figure out what could be the transformation from the state to the value you care about. So we can take a, a more concrete example. I hope this is true. I like this course. And this is a sentence uh, uh, people uh, do with like, nat natural language processing. And they usually want to like, take uh, this, this word, for example, the part of speech or sentiment or like, how to pronounce uh, this word. So, for neural network, we can actually do uh, a, a first uh, the text embedding to represent the word into a, a, a feature vector to describe uh, the word. And then we have uh, initially, we, init we have a hidden state. But of course, at the beginning, we know nothing about the sequence or the word. So we can just initialize the hidden state as all zero fa vectors. And then to do the processing, we give uh, we fit into the input and the hidden state to a neural network, and then give you out the updated uh, the hidden state. And then we can do another uh, fully connected layer to do the prediction to whatever uh, uh, labels we are interested at. It, and then we can do it over and over again to unroll it over the input and time uh, to generate all the uh, prediction we care about. And as I talk about, there are some labels like uh, the part of speech we want to say, OK, this is pronoun, this is verb, and this determinant, and this is a, a, a noun. So to do this, we can have an evaluation function to, com 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 uh, to compare these two to compute the loss. And to do, this, uh, to do this, we are actually taking advantage of it's actually the same processing. So we can combine uh, the loss. Instead of just looking at one loss, we actually accumulate all the loss together. And then when do bad propagation, we bad propagate that uh, through, uh, through all the units over the time. So this is very general and very good property for learning. So unlike uh, we learn this, each of a neural network as a separate function, this allow us uh, allow us to have an ability to process diff uh, sequences uh, at different lengths or a different, uh, 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 different lengths and different like, time durations. So take an analogy between the convolution network we just talked about. When in convolution network, we do talk about like filters. So we can do uh, the parameter sharing uh, uh, around the local uh, patches. And similarly, in recurrent network, we're also do, do, doing this parameter sharing. But it is uh, sharing the parameters along the time. So the recurrent formula is like the filter we are doing in the 2D space. So this is, as I say, is uh, also more gen it accumulates the loss, so there are more information. And also, it can generalize better to different kind of sequences. So, but we talk about a lot of good thing you can do with recurrent neural network. But one very big problem uh, people are facing when training this new, uh, recurrent net network is the very vanish vanishing gradients problem. So take this uh, very simple three-layer recurrent uh, net, for example. So for input, you apply the weight and the recurrent formula and over and over again for three times to get a loss. So to do it, uh, we know how to do it for the very last layer. You just take a loss, and you want to update uh, the weight at third layer. And you just uh, using a chain, chain rule to take a loss with rep respect to the recurrent formula and the weights. And this is easy. But the problem happens when we're talking about if we are going back 
back in the time, like 10 time steps or 20 time steps ago. And we're actually unrolling uh, the, uh, this uh, deriv derivative over and over. So you can see like it expands really quickly and it could be like uh, chained up to like 50 and 70 times. Yeah. So for, for this, you can imagine if this number is like a larger than one, when you do a several multiplication, you just become a giant value. And when you take gradient for the giant value, you basically see the waves just jumping over from here to there, here, there. And then you basic, we basically learn nothing from, uh, from the gradients. And another problem is if the value is very small. So when the value is very small, when you chain it up, it becomes an even more smaller number and close to zero. So basically, when you update the network, the weight is basically just flat and doesn't uh, move anymore. So you can think, think like the information is not really flowing along the network. So we doesn't really take, take advantage of the sequence and learning the dependency between the information at time 100 and time like 10, for example. So this is, has a problem in learning the long dependency. But sometimes we really want the long dependency. For example, when we talk about sentence, uh, uh, talk about sentences or paragraph. They are dependency from like uh, the pronoun for the next two sentences is depend on uh, the one I just talked about now. So there are several approach uh, people have been uh, discovered to uh, fix this problem. So for gradient explosion, people just very simple. We just clip it to have a maximum value so it don't explode. So I won't talk too much about that. And for gradient vanishes, so basically the information is not flowing along the time. So people, just uh, people have been uh, designing new, new architecture in neural network to keep the gradients in the cell or ne network itself. So when, the, when we do updates, we can keep information from like a, a, a few time steps ago and then update the gradients instead of a uh, getting zero all the time. So one very famous uh, architecture people using, uh, you probably also hear about, is a uh, long short-term memory. So basically, they are introducing memory into uh, the neural network. And there's other uh, variations, and they prove a very similar uh, performance and easier to train, so like uh, gated recurrent net units. And Let's take a simple look at this uh, long short-term memory. So what they do is to introduce a gate to decide if we want to let inform the information flow through. So in, in addition to the hidden state I just talked about to summarize the state, uh, the information so far, they introduce another state called cell state. So cell state is basically to decide, okay, if I how, how much inform what's the information I want to keep and how much information I'll just release. So they have a three different uh, uh, gates to control this uh, cell state. So the first one is uh, forget. So when, in when the input get into uh, the cell, the forget unit will compare the input and the cell state to decide, okay, what are the uh, information or bits uh, we want to forget because they are irrelevant to what I'm looking at right now. And then they have uh, the input gates to select from the input to decide what are the elements in the, in the input we want to update uh, the current cell. And then finally, we can um, we decide uh, from the output gate to decide what to, uh, which part of the information we want to output. And this has been uh, nicely uh, allowed the neural network to train, even though the sequence uh, is uh, very long. So it's been successfully uh, used uh, first in like a speech or a translation, and then keep uh, like having improvements and other people trying to simplify this a little bit, just what I said, the gated recurrent unit. So when you are doing projects, you probably will choose between uh, different uh, cells and see their performances. So I would like to say uh, the recurrent unit, recurrent network is one way 
to like flexibly allow you to assemble different architectures to uh, dealing with your sequential data. So what we talk about is uh, this vanilla recurrent network. We, you, you have an input and map, map to the output. But actually, you can be very creative to dealing with a sequence of input and output. So for example, image captioning, you just have an input of one image. But you output a sequence of words to, to describe the object or action in the image. And there's also like, uh, you can do it like inversely. So for example, you have a sequence of uh, words or sentences. And then you just want to output, uh, at the end, have a one classification lab label to say this sentences is happy or sad. And of course, uh, you are using like Google Translate. They are also doing this kind of uh, translation. But since the translation the, between different languages is not the exact mapping, so they have like some many to many, but they may skip some of the word or rearrange uh, the words for the input and outputs. And of course, uh, the example we just look at is to mapping between the word to its labels, like uh, the part of speech. And we can go on and on and to have a different uh, examples, and especially when we talk, talk about like actions and reinforcement learning, people like to think about using this kind of sequence model to generate the actions or motor controls. So, this, uh, I have been, we have been talking about a uh, recurrent network or convolution nets, but what this, all this training paradigm we are talking about now is we have a label and then we want to uh, make some prediction to approximate this, la uh, to, to match this label to do uh, the supervised learning. But actually there are like some different kind of learning we want to look at. And especially, uh, we want to do it in, the, in an unsupervised way, where we don't have label, but we still want to learn uh, good representations or like good features about the input. So one, th uh, one thing I want to um, talking about is an uh, author encoder. So this is uh, in 1980s, uh, Yang Lekun uh, have this uh, idea. So when we have this input, if we don't know the label, how can we know our network is learning something to describe uh, your data? So one trivial idea, not, well, not that trivial, one idea is, to, uh, is to, to have our network to learn to reconstruct the image. And this autoencoder is actually uh, do it in two steps. So first, there's an encoder step to encode uh, the input image into a learned representation and earn dimensional vectors. And then we can have a decoder network to decode uh, what is encoded in the representation back into uh, the original uh, image. And then for training, we're actually uh, trying to figure out uh, how to up update the weights to minimize this reconstruction loss. So mathematically, this is what we the form to generate the representation and use it to reconstruct the image and then compare against uh, your input. So by this way, we're actually talking about learning the representation in the middle of uh, the structure. And, and we are thinking, if we learn a good uh, representation, it is actually can, can keep all the information pretty well to regenerate whatever input uh, we are given. So there are some question about like, oh, oh. there are some question about, okay, what this learned representation are about. So there are several views. So first of, some people may think about uh, from like linear algebra or like point of view, they can think about this as like multi uh, uh, manifolds in the high dimensional manifolds. Or if you are familiar with like a PCAs, they could be the reduced dimensions in the PCA space. But there's actually another view uh, to looking at this problem. So some people in the generative model, thinking about this as uh, the latent variable to generate the data. So to make it more concrete, we can think about there are some uh, example from computer vision and graphics. 
When you know this kind of latent variable like color, shape, and positions, you can regenerate uh, the, the shape in objects in, in the scene. So when we are observe the data, the goal of learning is actually to uncover uh, the distribution of the data so we can like resample and regenerate it. And one very desired property and why we want this generative model is once we have a model, we can do a lot of interesting things uh, using the model. For example, you can sample a new data point you've never seen before from the data. Or when you get a new instance, you want to really see if they are like from, can describe using these variables or from the similar distribution. You can evaluate the likelihood of the data. Or more, more importantly, when people are talking about representation, you can extract uh, the latent features uh, from the network, like uh, using the latent variables, you describe uh, the model and data. But uh, there's a really big problem to do this also nicely when we talk about intuition. But it is a problem uh, to evaluate uh, the to, to come out the model and the distribution because it is really hard to computing uh, the posterior exactly, especially for some uh, distribution, they are really complex. And it is hard because we need to like sample through all possible uh, uh, latent values and then do a marginalization over the landscape, which make it uh, intractable. So some idea people have been uh, proposed uh, this year, one way is, uh, the variational autoencoder. So talking about the generative model we just uh, described. So you can think about there's a latent variable and there's a decoder network to generate uh, the ob observed data. So, but it is really hard to compute, uh, uh, to, to, to compute uh, the distribution. So one idea is Instead of, instead of, uh, instead of uh, computing the likelihood uh, of, of the latent variable, we are, we are doing this with a much simpler and tractable distribution. So it could be like Gaussians or like some easier distribution which we are manageable to do it. And then the goal is, is from the data we learn uh, we, we learn this approximate inference uh, network and then use it to reconstruct uh, the image. So the learning objective now is be becomes, first, still we have a reconstruction error to figure out what's the difference between the reconstruction. But there's another measure is how close this approximate uh, distribution approximate network and how close they are to the real uh, distribution of Latin variables. So this uh, allow us to train, um, train to generate the data. So when you are only looking at this network, we are doing the inference from the data to figure out what's the Latin variable, which are important. And when you are using this part of the network, we are uh, trying to using the learned uh, generative model to generate the data and evaluate uh, the observations. Of course, there's also another formulation uh, you may already hear about a lot of times from media. So instead of uh, formulating the probability distribution, likelihood, and posterior exactly, so another idea is doing adversarial training. So in adversarial training, it is uh, actually also an, imp an implicit uh, generative model. So instead of uh, talking about we want to approximate which distribution, it model it as a minimax game. So there's a, instead of a generator, they introduce uh, the discriminator to, uh, to, to, uh, to guide uh, the distribution changes. So for the discriminator, they want to uh, distinguish if the generator generate the data is, ex is, sim is the same or is a, uh, the generate data, are they like real or the fake uh, samples? 
And for the generator, the goal is basically to generate the fake data, which uh, will close to the original distribution to fake, uh, to, to fool the discriminator. So take uh, this uh, example they have uh, in the paper. The black dot is the original data distribution. And we can initialize the discriminator and generator randomly at the beginning. And at learning starts, uh, the discriminator will uh, figure, classify what are the data points, are the fake or real. And then the generator take the, uh, the, the feedback, the, uh, take the gradient and to learn to approximate uh, to, to the distribution to uh, get closer to the uh, original data distribution. And then they do it over and over again till the conversions. And the final learning goal is, we, is to maximize the loss of discriminator. Because by the time, you basically cannot tell what is from the generative model or the original data distribution. So this is just uh, some idea about how people thinking about can we uh, learn the data unsupervisedly or like from a different perspective, like generative model and allow us to do more tasks. And of course, this is our just some uh, quick and high level uh, introduction of different kind of network. And we are only touching about the surfaces. So feel free to like read uh, the, the, the original papers or some link we included uh, in the slides. And this is uh, all the tutorial we are talking about today. And we will have, a, before we take questions, so there are, we will have hands-on session tomorrow. And we will do a PyTorch uh, tutorials on all the topic, well, not the generative model ones we're talking about today. And if you, are, if you want to run it uh, use on your computer, uh, you can install a uh, PyTorch and Jupyter Notebook. But if you don't want to install it on your computer or it takes too much time to installing it, so don't bother to do it, we are going to run it using a Google Colab. Uh, so you can run the Jupyter Notebook and installing everything from that. We will have an uh, instruction for that tomorrow. So, as long as you have a Google account. Yeah, so make sure if you don't want to install it, have your Google account. <laughs> so you can uh, do all the uh, examples we give you. So let's so any questions. All right. If no, we are